Uh, good evening, um, everybody, and um, you're all very, very welcome to this webinar uh, organized by the Chagas uh, Horticultural Development Department. Um, my name is Andy Welton, and um, I'm your host here this evening. Um, with me is, is my colleague, uh, Owen Sweetnam, and I'm sure uh, most of you um, have met Owen uh, at, at this stage. Um, we're talking about viruses. We're focused on virus diseases in carrots and parsnips, and we're very fortunate to have two uh, specialist speakers, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen. We have Howard Hines, who is joining us from uh, Nottinghamshire in the UK, and we have got our own uh, colleague, Michael Gaffney, from our own department, uh, horticultural department as well. Without any further ado, I'm going to just introduce our first speaker, uh, Howard Hines. Howard has his own company, Root Crop Consultancy. Uh, Root, he's a graduate of uh, Nottingham Trent University in Applied Biology um, from the early 80s. Um, he, he would have worked uh, for a period of time as a potato agronomist with, with McCain Foods. Um, but for the last 25 years or so, he's been probably looking more at, at carrots and parsnips but still some potatoes, um, having worked with plant systems, who some of you may know as a consultant in the, in the early days, but since 2006, he has had his own company uh, specializing in carrots and parsnips. Um, covers all the main areas in the UK and Scotland, <clears throat> from Yorkshire through to Lynx, uh, Shropshire, Scotland, and of course, Nottinghamshire, where he lives, which is a big growing area. Uh, very involved in trials and development work, and he's a key guy in the British Carrot Growers Association uh, in respect of research and development and what goes on at industry level. He's also involved in the European Advisors Experience Exchange Network and the Association of Independent uh, Potato Consultants. So that's, that's Howard. Uh, before perhaps we, we get Howard's uh, presentation, I'm gonna ask Owen to maybe do a very, very short uh, poll of, of our participants here tonight and that might just give us some little bit of a steer on how you guys are thinking in relation to some of the, the, the stuff we're going to be talking about. So Owen, can you launch that please? Thanks Andy. Um, yeah, I'll launch the poll now. So it should be on your screens now. Um, yeah. And the, there's three questions. The first question is, in your opinion, which of the below represents the greatest risk to carrot production? Aphids or viruses, nematodes, carrot fly, cavity spot, leaf diseases or weeds. Second question is, in your opinion, which of the below represents the greatest risk to parsnip production? Aphids, viruses, nematodes, carrot fly, canker, leaf diseases or weeds. And finally then, how concerned are you about the loss of pesticides in carrot and parsnip production? Not at all concerned, somewhat concerned, quite concerned, or very concerned. So we appreciate your, your feedback here, and it'll be interesting to, to see the results of this poll. Um, I can just see the, the answers coming in now. Just give you a few more seconds there to get your answers in. Okay, um, I'm going to end the poll now. If everybody's just maybe one or two more coming through. Okay, so the um, the results there actually a bit of a bit of a mix. Um, the first question, in, in your opinion, which of the below represents the greatest risk to carrot production? Um, twenty five percent saying aphids or viruses, um, only thirteen on nematodes. Carrot plays the greatest one, thirty-eight percent, and cavity spot then with a good share as well. Um, on parsnip, <coughs> canker is uh, quite an overwhelming um, favourite there. Fifty-six percent saying canker is, is the greatest risk in parsnips. Um, nematodes and viruses also featuring. Um, and there you look, that tells its own story. Most growers, uh, most of the audience, very concerned or quite concerned about the loss of pesticides. Um, <laughs> Or in personal production. Um, can you see the re results there, Andy? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we can see those. Um, that's great. Oh, and listen, thanks for that. 
Great. Um, and thanks to everybody for engaging there. Um, that's always helpful. So look, with that, I'm going to hand right over to, to Howard. You've met Howard. Um, Howard, you've seen the results. Um, um, carrot fly. We, we, we thought we dealt with carrot fly last year. I hope we did. But look, I'm sorry if people are going to be disappointed. It's, it's viruses is what we're talking about tonight. But I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Howard, you'll, you'll be able to comment on those results based on what you were finding with the, the, the people in through the British Carrot Growers Association. So look, I'll leave it to Howard. If you don't mind sharing your screen, Howard, and uh, we'll let you speak there for 30 odd minutes, all right? Yeah, okay. Do you want me just to comment on those results first, um, Andy? Please do, yep. Yeah, hang on. Let me just get my, my presentation up first and then... All right. I'll, uh, share my screen. Just have to bear with me. Um, That's can it. everybody see that? You see that, Andy? That's in full mode. Yeah, just yeah. just uh, maybe put it on full full screen. That's yeah. perfect. Is that okay? That's, that's spot on. Yeah. Right. Um, the only uh, surprise um, about the um, I'll just stop my video so uh, you don't see me there um, on the poll was carrot fly. I think um, we'd agree the British carrot growers basically put um, aphids and virus at the top of their list sort of closely followed by cavity spot. And then um, volunteer potatoes came up quite high because, you know, losing linear on, we're, we're having problems there. Um, and um, nematodes after that, and then probably leaf diseases. And, and carrot fly came quite a way down from that. So I don't know whether we're just sort of getting getting away with using pyethroids at the moment. So, um, um yeah, anyhow, I'll, uh, maybe there's some questions on that later. So I'll, I'll, I'll start plowing through the presentation now, anyhow. Um, and what, what I'm going to go through is, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's moving. Yeah, that's fine. That, yeah, that's fine, Howard, yeah. Got stuck for a minute. Yeah, that's What I'll perfect. do is I'll, I'll just go through the virus symptoms just so you know what, what we're experiencing in, in the UK. Um, it could be different with you. And then... I just want to go through some of the aspects of 2020, which was a really bad virus year for us. But the one thing it did do is it, we learned a hell of a lot, probably more than we had done in the last 10 years. Um, and it, this had sort of knock on um, to several areas of integrated control that we started looking at as well as, 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 as apicides. So I'm going to go through some of those various aspects as trapping forecasts, sowing dates, seed rate, variety, biological control. And then I'll just finish off with a, a very new project that I was involved with, some trials on some, uh, on some dyes at the end, which is fairly hot off the press at the moment. Um, even the UK growers haven't seen, seen the results, so you're, you're a, you'll be ahead of them. Um, so just to go on to the carrot virus, um, the foliar symptoms, in the top left there, the first one that seems to come in, or the first one that seems to show symptoms is parsnip yellow fleck, where it, you can see it can kill some of the, the small plants off. And we tend to get this black, um, black blackening of the growing points. When, when it affects plants, which are a bit further on, they, they can sort of get by it, but we're not quite sure what effect that's going to have on the, on the roots. Um, then the bottom left, uh, this is a fairly new one that was discovered on a, a Ferro project in about six years ago. It's um, carrot yellow leaf, which has implications for, for, for root symptoms, which I'll show you in the next slide. And then the middle one, um, the carrot red leaf virus. We know we get carrot red leaf virus, but this op can also look very much like Aster yellows because we're not regularly testing for it. You know, I think there's always a question mark as to um, is it red leaf or, or Aster yellows. And then the top right and bottom right is probably the, our most common and most damaging virus, which is carrot motley dwarf virus. And this can come in a complex with the red leaf as well. Um, 
And we think this is the one that really does the yield. Sometimes we don't always see, um, we don't see root symptoms from it, but we think it just reduces yield um, through, through the fact that the plants are, are dwarfed and yellow. And then going on to the root symptoms, the top left, um, this is a fairly common one um, where we get splitting. We, we sometimes call this kippering. And, and sometimes this is associated with black spotting. And you can see in the bottom left, that's, that's a typical route where we just had the black spotting only. And we're not quite sure what foliar symptom, what, fo what foliar virus actually causes this. It could be motley dwarf, red leaf, yellow leaf virus. Could even be passing the yellow fleck has an influence on it later on, but it could even be a combination of these. And it's, it's where we need further research, I think. The middle one is the hairy leaves. We often see to, seem to get that when we get the red leaf virus. Um, but this can often look very much like Asti yellows as well. So again, we're not doing enough testing to know whether this is a virus or it's um, a plasma which is um, what causes us the yellows. And then the far right was uh, one of our breakthroughs in the last five years when Ferrer did a big project on yellow leaf virus. And uh, they found it was high, highly associated with this ne internal necrosis, which was causing processing growers major difficulties. Um, you only need a few, per few percent of these internal necrosis um, in a, in a load going to a, to a processor to cause big problems. And it's very difficult to, to grade off because sometimes the roots look, look quite normal um, until you look at the very end of them when you see this necrosis. And then another area where, where we need um, more research, I think is we don't know a lot about parsnip viruses. We're pretty sure we get parsnip yellow fleck with that top middle slide there. Um, but, you know, what, what the other foliar symptoms are caused by, you know, we just need more research. You can see the root symptoms there. Um, you can get these raised sort of blackened eyes or brown eyes, and then, and then you also get this kippering. But again, there's been so little work done on parsnip viruses where, where you know, it, it really needs another project. So, just to review 2020, um, as I said, it was, a, it was a bad virus year. And I think in part, we started on, on the wrong foot. We had a very wet autumn of 2019 and winter and into the spring. And we had a lot of crop that should have been lifted that wasn't, um, and a lot of strawed crop that wasn't strawed. So we had a lot of crops like the, um, the picture at the top right there, where, which started to regrow in the spring. Um, and this was a great reservoir, reservoir for aphids. And you can see on that bottom um, right picture, you might just see on the bottom stem, a uh, wingless willow aphid. And that was actually taken this, um, this February when it was frosty in a, in a crop of regrowing um, carrots. So that they're quite tough, even with a mild winter. They even with a cold winter, they can they can survive on the regrowth. So it's the second year without cruiser seed dressing, and I think all this came together in a perfect storm. And we, you know, in in Yorkshire where we got quite high levels, we were seeing yield reductions up to thirty percent of virus, which was was really hurting the growers. Um, but we did learn, as I've mentioned, a lot from this year. So just to recap on where we are with aphids, with yourselves and, and in the UK, in, um, as I said, the, the loss of cruiser was a, was a big, big problem for us because that, that controlled a lot of the early, early aphids that were transmitting viruses. Um, then last year we lost Biscaya. Um, and we know from when we've sent um, aphid samples to Rothamsted over the last few years, nearly all the willow aphids come back as resistant. And it's the same, same story as the peach potato aphids. 
Um, in the UK, we did manage to get Topeki as an emate, emu last year, which was one, one bonus. Um, we've got Movento, like you. Flipper is approved, but growers at the moment, they, they're finding it's just that it's a cost barrier at the moment for them getting into it. And I guess with it being a biological, you know, learning how to use it is, um, is another factor. And Minecto One is just starting to be used um, in the way I think you're using Benevia. Um, but I think the problem Ireland has is that you have some of the insecticides we've got, but you have no, at the moment, you have no real conventional knockdown products. Um, so um, the Topeka, even though it's not, not strictly a knockdown, does, does stop, stop the aphids feeding fairly, fairly rapidly by paralyzing the mouth parts. So we come on to IPM and one, one of our big tools over the last 10 or 15 years has been trapping. And what we're really looking for is willow carrot aphid, um, peach potato aphid, and then two parsnip aphids, all which colonize carrots and, um, and parsnips as well. Um, we have quite a good network of suction traps and, and I was talking to um, Andy and Owen about this set that you have, you have some in various areas as well. And these, these are good, useful, but um, sometimes do, don't account for local variations. So we rely more on the yellow water bowls, which you can see in that top right, which you have to fill with water each week, and then we drain them out and send them off to Ferra. Um, and we can usually get, get a result back in a day or so. And we, at the moment, we've got four packers actually, um, um, or four large growers all working in, in cooperation with this. So we're not trying to double up sites in various areas. And even where growers haven't got the yellow traps, if they're further south, they can see aphids building up in, in other people's traps. So this, this has worked quite well. Um, and um, in 2020, it also, I'll show you a slide in a minute, where it, it highlighted where we were getting uh, migrations from, from the old crop into the new. And you can see this with this chart. Um, the, the, these are all sites in Yorkshire, um, all fairly close together within, within a sort of 50 mile radius of each other. But you can see the, um, the Selby and the south of York sites suddenly had huge spikes in, uh, towards the end of May. And this was almost at the same time that fields over the road were being lifted. This is old crop. So there was obviously a big move. And this is where the regional suction traps wouldn't pick this type of sort of spike in your crops up. The other thing to notice that, which is quite important, the willow aphid is quite concentrated in its migration from sort of middle of May, almost to the middle of June. And there isn't a lot outside of that. On a regional level where some of these packers are growing in different areas in Yorkshire, again, you can see, see the, the, there are differences. In, in 2020, Yorkshire was very high and, um, and Staffordshire was very high as well. Or that did seem to be out of sync with everything else. In 2015, when we had a bad year, North North got it very bad. Um, so it, it, we don't quite know why one region gets more in, in any one season than another, but it, it does, it, it, it's difficult to predict um, ahead, ahead of the season. The other thing that we've started using more and more of is um, the, um, um, Willow aphid model, which was developed from Warwick University. Um, and we find this is quite good. The, the water traps are always telling you a week behind what you have, but the, um, the model will give you some warning as to when you're going to hit this threshold, which is that, that dotted line you see. Um, and you can see that, you know, they're, they're sort of hitting it in that sort of um, um, May period. Um, in the areas where, where I'm working. Um, and we are now starting to use local weather data rather than regional weather data to run this model on. It's fairly straightforward to do it. 
Um, and we've, in the last two years, we found it's almost been within a day or two of when, when we found these aphids, pick these, the first aphids up in the traps. So it seems, it seems fairly accurate model. On sowing dates, one of the sort of lessons we learned from 2020 was that um, uh, although most crops got high levels of virus, um, any crop that was sown after mid-May and emerged after the, that sort of middle of June period, because we got a very dry period from mid-May to early June, so a lot of seed just sat dry. But we found those later crops, which you see at the bottom there on the, on the right, hardly on the left, sorry, hardly got um, any virus, whereas crops that uh, emerged before that period were sort of hammered by it. Um, and I think this was the biggest lesson we learned that although we got um, peach potato aphid and the parsnip aphids coming in after the willow aphid in, in June and July, it seemed to be most, most of the infection or transmission was coming from the willow aphid and uh, I'll, I'll just uh, explain that at the end how we we, had, we changed our strategy for for controlling it um, of course sowing it, sowing late's a, a good option for IPM but if you've got um, early crops or processing crops it's not it's obviously not an option otherwise you're not going to get the earliness or the yield out of them seed rates another area you can see here where you've got a, a less dense area where it's, it's, it looks like it may have capped or blown. You're getting far more virus coming into the crop. So, you know, this is an option where you're, you're, you, you're trying to produce a packing crop. You know, you can up the seed density, which you know, does seem to... The, the aphids, which I'll come on to the end, like the contrast between green and brown. And the more contrast you got, the more they seem to be attracted to the crop. Um, but again, for, for low density crops like processing crops, it's, it's not an option to, to increase the seed rate. Variety is one thing we've noticed, um, certainly in 2020, that uh, Nairobi seemed to get hit much more than some of the newer varieties, you know, such as Norfolk from, from Bayo and Polydor from Hazira. And, and a few others as well, which just look to be um, much less um, susceptible, whether this is resistance or some other factor. Um, but the disadvantage we find is that, you know, Nairobi is still the bigger, biggest yield and easy, easiest to handle. This just shows you, um, this was on in the same field at the BCGA trial site in Nottinghamshire in 2020. And you can see that taken on the same day, I think this shot was taken in early October. The Nairobi is really riddled with virus, whereas the Norfolk next door, you know, there was virus in it, but nowhere near as much. So coming on to um, the last part, which is uh, biological and physical control. Um, it, we're still at an early stage. I would say the only the good thing about losing the only good thing about losing sort of Cruiser and Biscaya is that we do, with with Mavento and Topeki, we are finding that they're much kinder on on things like ladybirds and lacewings, um, and certainly this year we saw more ladybirds in the crop than I've I've ever seen, um, and we are involved in there are projects going on, um, looking at wildflower strips and introducing aphid predators, and we've we've done a bit of work with one of the farms putting putting lacewings in, but. The problem is getting them, the willow aphid comes in so early, it's getting enough of these predators in numbers to actually uh, make a difference. Um, as far as um, covering crops, I'll, I'll come onto a slide in a minute, um, but we, a, a long while ago, we did some trials with Swede mesh and we found that totally kept the virus out, but obviously very expensive on a carrot crop. Um, but we think fleece uh, is, is an option and I'll, I'll, I'll come on to a, the next slide. I think it should be on that. And then fi finally, I'll just show you this, um, this dye project where we're looking to try and fool the aphids by, um, by removing this contrast of green and brown. 
so this this is where we think we can we can um, help with the early crop and in even some of the the crops that you might not think of covering. Um, we found that a lot of fleece crops that were left on late in 2020 didn't get as much virus. So um, this year, one particular grower in Yorkshire who normally grows about uh, 150 acres of fleece actually put down 300 acres of his thousand acres this year. And he was, it, apart from the stuff he needed to move early for demand, he left the majority of this 300 acres under fleece until almost till the end of June, some of it, but certainly by mid-June. And this, this was when the aphids, the willow aphid was declining. And we, are, we hardly saw any virus in, in, these, in, in the crops when they were covered, uncovered. The other thing he did, which I wasn't that comfortable with, um, he decided to, again, to work on this green-brown contrast by leaving his cover crop much, much longer. I think there'd been some work with the sugar, with British sugar um, in sugar beet crops on this, um, showing that the, the longer you left the barley, the more it, um, it masked the fact there was a, a crop there. Um, but taking the barley out of this stage does, does have an impact on the carrots and they take a while to come around from it. So just finishing up on this, um, this trial, that um, I initiated with, with another company, we thought that rather than you know, leaving fleece on for a long while, which has its costs and, and practic practicalities um, and leaving the barley too long, we would try and fool the aphids by, um, by applying different dyes. And these, these are all sort of natural dyes. Um, and you can see there on the on the left, we had three rates of green dyes and an untreated strip in the middle, and then three rates of blue dyes at the far end. And the first application we put on the 14th of May, which is just ahead of the willow aphid coming in, the carrots at that stage were just like pot lead into one true leaf. So the other question mark was, would the, would the dyes kill the crop? We didn't know that, so we, we weren't doing it on a big area. Um, there you can see where the arrow is, that's the, the high rate of the blue dye. And then we've just got um, um, my colleague, uh, Nick's uh, just putting the, the high rate of the green dye on, on, that, on that timing. And then um, we then, um, just gotta move that because I can't see the date on that, but that looks like the second treatment, which was, um, um, about two weeks after. So you can see there to the, to the left is the high rate of the green dye on the second application. We found it started, you should be able to see a shot in a minute of showing the, the fact that the first dye had nearly worn off by this stage on the 27th of May. If you look, he's just putting the, two of the three plots of the high rate green dye on there where the first blue arrow is. If you look at the right hand far arrow, um, then those two beds had, had not been treated yet. And you can see that's, that's, there was a little bit of color left from the 14th of May, but not much. Um, then we did an assessment. I did a passing yellow fleck assessment in uh, 30th of June when we started seeing it coming in. And it was quite interesting, the low rates uh, of the green dye, well, certainly the very low rate didn't seem to be any better than the untreated, but the high rate was certainly looked to be given a reduction. And that was the same with the, um, all the rates of the blue dye seemed to be giving a, a bit of a reduction. I, I must state that this wasn't a replicated trial, so you know, we need to repeat this work and do it on a, a bigger le level. Um, and if you, if you look at the very bottom there, the field levels uh, where it had had a full insecticide program, I should state that all these dyes were applied and there was no insecticides applied at all on them. So the uh, high green rate was nearly equivalent to a full insecticide program. And then looking at yield in September, which I think is one of the, the biggest indicators of how how well you've done on virus control. 
the high rate of green um, and the high rate of blue, uh, we're, we're nearly 30% higher than the untreated, um, which was similar, similar sort of uh, level of um, increase we got from, from the full uh, uh, insecticide program. So we, we, we're quite, quite excited about this. And like I say, we, we're going we're gonna to do more work next year on, on it. So just to finish up on the last um, slide, you know, what have we done differently since we got hit in 2020? Um, well, we now limit, I should say limit insecticide armory, uh, and we just concentrate it in that period when the willow aphid is around for those four weeks. So we're not trying to spread the insecticides over the whole season. We're using, um, we're using the model more and, and, and linking that to local weather data to know when they're, they're, they're about to come in. And we also started, because we're, we're sort of concentrating the sprays in a shorter period, we're even using two modes of action together. So a knockdown like Topeki and then a more persistent product like Moventa. But that's not an option with you. Um, I think fleece covers will carry on doing that, leaving them on longer. Um, some, th this one particular grower, I know the processing grower will leave his barleys longer. I'm not sure if everyone is going to do that before removing. And I think we're going to be starting to see the use of more new varieties that look to be less susceptible to, um, to virus infection. So that's, that's the end of, um, of my presentation. Okay, um, thanks very much, Howard. Um, excellent stuff. Um, that was a really good overview, I think, of, of, of what's going on, obviously in relation to, to uh, viruses, the state of play, um, certainly in the UK. Uh, where you're at and where where it's where it's likely to go, it looks like it is an integrated approach going forward. Um, we've um, there's probably a number of questions, um, but I suppose we'll give people a little bit of time to to think about things. One question actually I had, and you might be able to to answer it straight away. That that picture you put up of the the, the BCGA trial in nuts, mm. um, you were looking at Nairobi compared there to. Um, Nor Norwich, I think, or Norfolk. Nor Norfolk, yeah. Yeah. Did did they? I mean, what was the treatment in relation to fly con or in relation to aphid control there? I don't know because it was on a it was on a the house farmer is somebody I know, but I don't sort of I don't they have an internal agronomy agronomist who, who does their agronomy, but okay. Basically, the whole field would have had the same insecticide program. There wouldn't been any difference. So you yeah, are, it's uh, yeah. So you're, the, seeing, the, you're seeing the variety difference there, and and certain, other variety, yeah. other varieties within there. You know, some of the Hazera varieties look just as green as that, as the Norfolk did. Um, right, it, it it certainly shows up Nairobi, doesn't it, as being obviously yeah. that bit more susceptible. Yeah. Um, we've, we've we've time for maybe one or two questions here that have come in um, in relation to your work on the dyes. Um, a comment or maybe a question. The barley cover crop was also used in all those dye trials. Is that correct, uh, Howard? It was, it was, but we had a big um, replicated insecticide trial ahead of that. I didn't, you probably saw the white canes. And yeah. basically we we had to, because we didn't want the farm to go in with any insecticides through the trial area, we we, we controlled all the, the the barley removal. So we took it out much earlier. And I think you can see on some of them slides that the farm barley looks very green and ours, the trial, we took yeah. it out. We took it out at the stage I'd normally take it out. At. So the barley shouldn't have had that much influence on, on, on those results. And a slide off, off, I mean, there is a question about how you took out the barley. I presume it was with one of the, the, the standard. Yeah, it's just with, just with fusillade. Yeah. Yeah, we just, okay. Yeah. Okay, all right, listen, uh, maybe we'll just leave it uh, at that for now, uh, Howard. Um, again, ladies and gentlemen, could I encourage you to, to maybe um, ask questions when we have Howard online here tonight, um, highly experienced um, agronomist, 
And I think um, we have an awful lot to learn from people like Howard. So look, feel free to, to ask questions. The tab is down at the bottom. So bang in your comments or your questions there. And um, Howard is prepared to field questions besides those on viruses he's told me. So um, now is your opportunity. So look, uh, moving on, um, can we um, ask Michael Gaffney? My, Dr. Michael Gaffney is, is our colleague based in, in Chagas and Ashtown. Michael's a senior research officer and um, he has responsibility for entomology and horticultural crops. Uh, he works on a, a, a wide range of pest monitoring, crop protection, food safety, and in recent times, um, peat replacement. Uh, Michael has an interest in developing IPM tools, and uh, he has worked on the Best for Soil project for the last three years to develop a, a decision support tool to help growers create more pest and disease resistant uh, rotations. And uh, that's what he's going to talk to you a little bit about tonight and uh, focus on uh, plant pathogenic nematodes. So Michael, thanks for um, supporting us and uh, we look forward to your uh, presentation. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, Sorry. So thank you for that, Andy. Yeah, so as Andy mentioned, we've spent the last three years working on a project called Best for Soil. Can you is, hear me, Michael? I can. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Michael, yeah. Okay. Can I continue? I, I, I think so, yeah. I think yeah, go ahead, great. Michael, yeah. Thanks. Um, so as I said, we've been working for the last three years on a project called Best for Soil in collaboration with some colleagues, yeah, I think in, we... some colleagues in uh, Europe. And really the point of Best for Soil was to compile existing knowledge and make it available to um, make it available to growers, uh, but taking published uh, material and trying to make it more accessible. So uh, fact sheets and videos about the use of green manures, organic amendments, uh, et cetera. And they're all available on the website, at the, which is bestforsoil.eu. And I encourage you to go and have a look. But one of the tasks we had was to create a tool to design rotations, which minimize the carryover of pests and diseases uh, with throughout a rotation. And it's about one of these that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so we were looking at creating a tool. We took 70 crops in total, uh, 29 horticultural, 41 arable. And then we listed all of the potential pathogens and nematodes of all of these crops and we basically searched for interactions between them and we were particularly interested in interactions where um, that would highlight where a pest or disease would damage a crop and when a pest and disease would be able to survive on a crop two slightly different things and then we created a very large database and sent out the bagging and they create created a decision support tool based on that um, work and i'm just going to work through an example with you uh, today on how to use the tool and I'm going to focus on nematode damage in root crops. Um, so nematodes, as you know, are tiny unsegmented roundworms, uh, which can be pathogenic to plants. Most of them have a stylet, which is a pin shaped uh, proboscis coming from their mouth. And they use that to feed on um, growing, uh, in this case, growing root crops. And it's usually that feeding that causes a distortion in the tap root. Now that usually in, in crops attacked by nematodes uh, manifests as fanging, which you can see in the picture here in the top right, where basically the top tap root splits at the point where the nematodes started feeding and you can get multiple growths uh, of smaller tap roots. Sometimes when the feeding happens, what ha you get fibrous root systems growing, proliferating underneath a, a short section of the tap root, as you can see in the bottom left um, uh, photograph here. Some other nematodes, such as the stubby root nematode, uh, do exactly the same. Once the nematodes start feeding on the actively growing crop, it almost stunts it in position, and then you get a proliferation of these smaller roots. So again, causing a total crop loss. So again, the, the symptoms of um, nematodes in, in crops can be slightly confusing because uh, diseases such as rhizocotonia, fusarium, um, issues with compaction, issues with uh, proliferation of, of stones in the seedbed can all cause similar type issues. So again, th these symptoms can be nematodes, but sometimes they could be mistaken for other things. There's other nematodes that maybe cause lesions or um, uh, lesions or uh, damage to the skin of the, of the taproot, such as the um, Pradolanchus pedotrans here on the left-hand side, which has been feeding on this uh, parsnip. You can see the brown flecking. 
but also uh, pratolinchus penetrans also causes stunting of the carrots, as you can see on the right hand side. So again, once the carrot is actively growing, where the nematodes start feeding, it, it's, the carrot almost uh, stunts and then starts to throw out odd shaped roots. So it's about dealing with pests like this that the best for soil tool was developed to try and help growers identify, um, to help growers try and identify uh, crops that will form rotations that are slightly resistant or more resistant to um, feeding from crop uh, from pests such as nematodes. So if you go to the website bestforsoil.ie and you can click on the database tab, this then brings you to a landing page where you can select pathogens or nematodes. For this example, we're just going to choose nematodes. When you go, that'll then bring you to another landing page where you have to fill in some information about the country, the soil type. It gives you an opportunity to tag the field so you know what it is. And then you can select the crops. Uh, so in this case, I've selected carrot and parsnips. And then you can select uh, the type of nematodes. Now you can choose all of the nematodes, or in this case, I've selected out just the number of nematodes that I would suspect would be damaging to carrots and parsnips. I would say is that you're then ready to create the scheme, but just to remember that you need to disable your pop-up blocker and you need to use a, um, well, basically the, this, the tool will not work with Internet Explorer. You need another, um, sorry, I forget the word. Um, you need something like Firefox or, or an, an, another type of browser. So once you create the scheme, this is the kind of feedback you get. So what it does is it lists, it lists the uh, crops you've selected. So at the red arrow that selected carrot and parsnip, you can see them listed there. And at the green arrow, you can see the individual nematodes that you've selected. Now what, so the, these nematodes are listed by their Latin name and their kind of common English name. So what you need to do is you then follow the, the pest down to where it intersects with a crop and it, you get a box. And it's at that box that where you start to get the information. So in this case, carrot cyst nematode and carrot. So I'm just gonna. So in this case, you, you get this box here, which is the intersection between carrot and carrot cyst nematode. And you can see the color of the box is purple. So this indicates that this nematode has the potential to cause serious damage uh, on this crop as per the legend below. You can also get different uh, color boxes such as peach, which indicates a medium level of damage and yellow, which indicates little damage. And then also green, which indicates that there is no damage. And if the box is white, that indicates that we don't know the level of damage that that nematode may cause that crop. Now, so that's in, so in, in straight away, it's telling you the level of damage you can expect. The next thing you, you see is that there are symbols in the boxes. These symbols indicate the level of, or how good a host the crop is for that particular pest. So in this instance, you can see a single dot between carrot and the stubby root nematode. And that's indicating that carrot is a poor host for that nematode. When you see two dots, that indicates that it's a moderate host. And when you see three dots, that indicates that it's a strong host. Where you see a dash, that indicates that it's just not a host. And where you see a question mark, that indicates that we don't know that it wasn't in the scientific literature how well a host that crop was for that pest. So that's the basic information you can get from the databases. Now, when you create a mock rotation, as I have here, you can start to begin to see how certain nematodes can move through a rotation almost undetected. So for, so for a very host specific nematode, such as carrot cyst nematode, you can see that after carrot, it doesn't infect parsnip, clover, bean, potato, barley, etc. They're all green and they all have a dash, which indicates that um, carrot cyst nematode is not a host on those crops. But if you were to move to something like Pratolenchus penetrans here, the root lesion nematode, you can see that actually all these crops or most of these crops have the potential to be a host of some kind. So you can see how this nematode, if it was in a field, could move through um, a rotation. And in some instances, such as with barley, where it's green, so it indicates that it doesn't damage that crop, the barley crop, but the two dots indicate that it's actually, actually a moderate host, which means that it can build up its populations. Similarly for perennial ryegrass, although the box is yellow, indicating it can give slight damage, again, it is a moderate host. So again, it's for situations like this that the tool was developed to help growers visualize 
potentially how pests and diseases may move through their rotations. One of the nice things about the, the tool also is that there's the development of a thing called the wikis. And what wikis do is they allow you to click on the box, the intersection between the crop and the pest, and that, that brings you, then brings you to a fact sheet. So in this case, you have, uh, um, sorry, in this particular instance, you have uh, a fact sheet, a, a small note on uh, carrots, this nematode and carrots. It tells you the symptoms you should be looking for. Leaves turn yellow, reddish yellow and are partially necrotic. It tells you that the reason for your issues is potentially that you have too narrow carrot rotation and that the solution to it would be to increase your rotation to one carrot crop in six years. And for, for some other crops, or sorry, for some other pests and crops, there are slightly larger fact sheets. Um, there's not fact sheets as yet for all, all, of the in, all of the potential crop and pest interactions, but there is about 1,300 of them prepared and they're being loaded, new ones are being loaded onto the website weekly. So there's quite a store of information being added to both databases. I think what's also interesting is as, as we move on to maybe dealing with new crops, such as cover crops and green crops, we know very little about the uh, interaction that these new crops will have with current pests and diseases. And as we can see from this readout, this is 22 common cover crops, which I've listed here, and I've challenged them against the existing nematodes that we've been discussing. You can see there's lots of question marks. So we have a lots of gaps in our knowledge, but also I think what you can see quite quickly is that for some nematodes, they, they can act on some, a lot of these cover crops can act as hosts for nematodes such as Pratolinchus penetrans for um, Meloidogon hapla as well. So again, we need to be careful as we add new cover crops and green manures potentially into our rotations that we're mindful of their potential to carry over um, nematodes and other diseases. Also, it, it does highlight as well how important it is to test if you suspect you have a nematode issue in that the species of nematode can, can be quite important. In this instance, you have Meloidogon phallax, which actually is, is uh, on perennial ryegrass, sorry, and Meloidogon phallax is quite a strong, uh, sorry, perennial ryegrass is quite a strong host for Meloidogon phallax, but actually if it was Meloidogon hapla, it's actually not a host at all. So again, more information uh, on the species of nematode you're dealing with can allow you to select different crops uh, and potentially use those crops to reduce populations in fields where you know you have an issue. So to conclude, the databases cannot diagnose or predict a problem. They, can, they need to be supported by testing and by good agronomic advice. Local knowledge is still key in these situations. The databases were developed to help growers plan rotations and to try and understand persistent issues in fields by helping growers to visualize the impact of previous crops. The wikis are a very useful source of information um, and they can uh, give growers good indication of where to start in terms of de developing a cultural uh, management strategy. And I think as soil-based nematicides and fungicides are coming under, under increased scrutiny, growers are gonna be increasingly reliant on control methods such as rotation and tools like this really are helpful in bringing a lot of the information from the published literature together and providing it to them uh, in quite an accessible uh, and easy form. I'd really encourage you to have a look at the website, uh, have a go at the databases and see how you get on. And if you have any feedback or queries, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks very much. Thanks, Michael. Andy, are you there or possibly? Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, um, I don't know if, yeah, my internet is very unstable here, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yeah, can hear you there now loud and clear, Andy. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. apologies, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, there's, there's, there's some instability down my way. This um, storm barra is, uh, causing his own problems. Uh, Michael, thanks for that. Um, we, have, um, we have some time for questions, ladies and gentlemen. And like I said, the, now is your opportunity. Um, could I, um, can you hear me all right? Yep. Me all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good. Um, 
Right. Can I fire in a question there, Howard, if you don't mind? Mm -hmm. You mentioned that we're 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 thin in respect of, of, of some chemicals compared to yourselves, and we don't really have um, a very good knockdown um, product to build into programs. But could you perhaps share um, what you think would be a good program with our audience and our growers online here tonight in terms of, you know, with whether it's the early crop or the main crop, what would be your prescription in terms of a program based on the products that we have, uh, Benivia and um, even the fatty acids? And Movento. Yeah, I would, I would say in the absence of a good knockdown, then your Benevia is best placed ahead of when the aphids are coming in. Um, and Movento in the early stages. Um, and then it may be a case, you know, if you're on um, 10 to 10 day intervals on those, maybe, maybe 14, if you want to stretch it out but I think if you're going to use the fatty acids then you need to come in in between those those timings we we don't have, we did some trials on 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 the fatty acids but we still got to analyze the results so I have a organic grower that's using them and he one year he didn't first year he used it he didn't think he got a good knockdown and this year he did so we're still sort of feeling our way with it but I would say you know with your lack of chemistry, you know, having having sort of alternating Benevia and Movento, obviously you've only got two of each, as close as you can, and then coming in between with a fatty acid and maybe, I don't know what sort of costs they are, but even, even adding a fatty acid to, say, a Movento treatment, like we, almost the same approach that we were doing with... Um, um, with Topeka and Movento in the same same tank mixture. And this was yeah. this was the, the first year we, we we tried it commercially, and it you know the virus levels we've got this year are very low. I mean, uh, it, it okay. may be partly in due to the fact that we yeah we didn't quite get the huge aphid numbers, but you know certain areas we're still quite high, and we we're we're, we're much lower virus than we were in 2020. Okay. And would you suggest, I mean, with Benivia, it's it's an expensive product, uh, so is Movento, but, mm. you know, good products are expensive nowadays, um, but they, they're, they're, they're friendly, I guess, compared to mm. some of the, the pyrethroids and the, 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 the other stuff. I mean, would you do anything with Benivia in terms of adding ad, uh, adjuvants or you know change the rates or anything or go half yeah. rates or is it best to just stick with it's well we would i would say keep to the full rate but this is another area we haven't really looked at I've done that on that's one of the, that slide one of the points before i came onto the dyes and and, and and that i think that i did make a mention of oils in there and i think um, it's yeah. an area which could could help i know the has been work in, in the potato crop that's shown using oils has reduced uh, virus, but um, we probably haven't sort of explored it enough in carrots to date. Yeah, you know, I, I think I think the message is there's there's where there is a lot of work and there's still an awful lot of gaps, I guess, in 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 um, in some of the information. Uh, thanks for that, Howard. Um, Owen, have you any questions coming through on the on the on the, the wires there? Yeah, yeah, we've a question and a comment here. Um, I'll just read it out. Just a quick point on graminicides such as Falcon, Stratus Ultra, Fusilade, etc. Um, lately, these products don't seem to be as effective for volunteer serial control, possibly due to a field resistance buildup, and in many cases, higher rate of herbicides uh, than is required or are required. Sorry. Did growers leaving barley cover crops in carrot crops late have any difficulty eradicating these cover crops, Howard? No, not not in this. We this is the first year we we've sort of pushed the barley that long. Normally we take it out when it gets to three tillers, and and this year that it was mainly with this one grow, but he did it on a big scale on a thousand nearly. Well, it wouldn't be quite a thousand acres because 
uh, but at 700 acres, he did it virtually on every crop and he was taking it out at six tillers. Um, and we find our favorite product in that situation is, is, is Fuse Laid Max. And we, we find it, it sort of performed pretty well, as well as you can knock a six tiller yeah. barley, barley out. Okay. It's going to take, take longer when they get to that stage. Just while we're still on the, that, that experiment, um, did uh, are, are growers in the UK considering going ahead with the, adopting the dyes in their crops next year, despite the incomplete research, given the the, the really really promising results? Um, is it is it very expensive? Is it not permitted, or why would they not try it anyway? We're at a really early stage because we're still talking to the manufacturer about how we go forward with this, um, and we need to do more sort of work on a sort of semi-commercial level, but. The costs, I think, are not going to be that far away from from your standard insecticides, from what we're looking at. I don't think that, and they're probably not going to be as expensive as, say, Benevia, at the rate, the rate, um, the high rate. So we're, we're sort of, because we're still talking with the um, the dye manufacturer, you know, we've literally got our first meeting with him next week. So, we, you know, I don't think, apart from what yeah. the sort of, the trials we're doing, you know, I can't see it being used commercially yet until we get a lot more data. But it was just one of those trials you don't often get get something which you know has a has an obvious advantage in in one year with a trial. And yeah. and are they are they just natural food dyes or what? What are the dyes? Yeah, they they're sort of. Um, uh, the type of dyes they're using, I think it's the type of dyes they're using sort of forestry sort of areas where they mark the trees. Um, okay. Uh, so okay. I think we've been told they're quite natural. I'm um, just trying to remember um, the, the actual um, the chemical makeup of them. But, I did, but okay. they, we found out it can be used in organic systems, so they can't be that, you know, that um, okay. uh, a problem for the environment. It's probably similar, I would imagine, to the the dyes they use as well in in, um, in golf courses. I'd say on on, yeah. on the greens, and I'd, I'd imagine there's there's quite um, strict environmental <coughs> rules around that as well. So it's probably the similar stuff, mm. I'd say. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thanks for that, um, Howard. Um, we we don't have too many questions um, on the the wires, but I I just had another couple myself, if you don't mind, Howard. You know the pictures were great that you showed early on in the time, and um, but do you always see foliar symptoms and not necessarily uh, symptoms underground? Or you know, or do you expect to find where there is some discoloration or problems on the foliage to get problems in the in the roots? Um, in 2020, I did quite a big survey of of one of the again it was this processing grower where. Virtually in every one of his fields, I took sort of a hundred whole plants, so tops and bottoms, um, and then I just looked at, you know, which ones were exhibiting foliar symptoms and which ones were exhibiting both root symptoms and foliar symptoms. And actually, the right the the number that was exhibiting root symptoms was quite low. It was quite often a lot of foliar symptoms, and the the carrots looked normal but what we think is happening is that you know sometimes they're looking normal but they're just not not reaching their yield their size potential so i guess the fact that right. uh, something like motley dwarf <clears throat> makes makes the plant go yellow is reducing sort of photosynthetic sort of potential so they're not getting enough into right. the root and that's where we saw that's where we think right. we saw that 30 percent reduction it wasn't it wasn't immortal yield because we were getting splits and black spots or anything like that. It was just purely a reduction in yield. Right. Okay. 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 Thanks for that. Um, Michael, you you wanted to make a, a comment, did you? Sorry, I was just wondering if Howard could go through again how they used the degree day model to plan their spray programs. I think it's a, a key message um, in terms of his presentation. Um, so again, I, I believe, I think you indicated that 
you, a week before you, you, you the predicted degree day target hits, you spray Benivia and then it's a follow up, and then every 10, 10 days until you until aphids have stopped migrating. Is that the, is that the strategy? Yeah, or sometimes you know we well we don't we use Minecto one, which is the the same active, but in a different form. Yeah, and or or with some growers who were maybe a bit sort of price um, sensitive for for the Minecto one, they would start off with a Movento ahead of that. So that's that's the other option. But either if I think it's important if you if you do kick off with the Benevia, you you fairly tight in with the Movento, you know, when the aphids start to appear, because you're not going to get knocked down with the Movento. Okay. Uh, you you satisfied enough with that answer there, Michael? Yep, no, that's great. Thanks. Great. Cheers. Thanks, um, Howard. Um Ladies and gentlemen, look, it's it's um, it's it's gone past eight o'clock, and I don't want to be delaying people unnecessarily. It's a bad night, um, even though I, I presume we're all staying in tonight. Um, there is there is football on the television as well, but um, in case anyone's interested. But look, um, Owen, is there any final questions coming in there before we we draw things to a close? There's just there's just one more, Andy, that we might just cover as well. Um, for Howard again, can you see a, a difference in seed produced in different places such as New Zealand and Canada? Just any comments on that, Howard? Okay, I don't know really because um, um, this is because um, a lot of our, our varieties are, are Bayo varieties, so I guess you know that's uh, main, mainly coming from the sort of um, New Zealand, Aust Australia sort of the end. Um, I don't think we get that many, many much seed that comes from Canada. But I might be wrong on that. But I'm I'm not aware okay. that much. It's it's all coming from the other, the other, the other end of the world. <laughs> okay, thanks, Howard. Um, I might just mention then, Andy, the two um, webinars we have coming up in the new year. We have one on the first of February um, with Andy Richardson. It's going to be a brassica disease webinar. You might remember Andy from a webinar we had about this time last year. Andy spoke on uh, brassica pests. So Andy is a, one of the leading UK brassica agronomists with ABC Agronomy. Um, and we'll be, we'll be lucky to have him again. He's, he's very, very good. Um, so that is the 1st of February uh, at 7 o'clock. And the invitation for that one will be sent out shortly. Um, we have another one then on the 8th of February on nutrition in vegetable crops and that one will we will be uh, joined by Lizzie Segu of ADAS and um, Mark Plunkett of Chagask. Um, Lizzie is going to look with, with, with the fertilizer prices gone as they are we've all we all can see them um, and we're probably probably there's a lot of concern out there about it um, and Lizzie's going to mention some of the the nitrogen um, measuring soil measuring um, technology that's, that's going on in the UK and some organic uh, some organic fertilizers so that will be um, on the 8th of February um, and, and again the invitation for that will be sent out shortly um, so hopefully look, we, we'll see you all then um, that's it Andy I think Okay, uh, great stuff thanks Owen um, look ladies and gentlemen um, I think we'll draw things to a close uh, and so look just leaves me to thank both of our speakers, um, both Howard and Michael. Um, I, I've certainly learned uh, things tonight. I hope you have done as well. Um, and I, I want to thank you for, for joining in um, and participating um, on this evening. So look, without any further ado, thanks again. Uh, we leave it at that. And uh, we look forward to meeting you hopefully in the new year. Good night. God bless. Thank you.